Hello and welcome back to another episode of Paint a Law. This is an ongoing series where each month I will talk about the law of an army while painting along to it. Uh, this month we are dealing with Warhammer Armies Undead. This is as a result of a poll that I ran for the subscribers on my channel asking should I do a video about Undead in general or should I do it specifically about the vampire counts? Uh, it was neck and neck there for a while, no pun intended, uh, but eventually the Undead won out. I'm quite excited about this in case you hadn't guessed. This was my first army, so this is really it holds a, a dear position in my heart, uh, so I can't wait to get started. Miniatures that I will be painting. You may have seen a little teaser in a short that I threw up on the channel, but uh, here it is. I am painting a Vangorian Lord. Now, yes, I know it's Age of Sigmar and it's not on square bases, but it's a really lovely model. And I, uh, you might have seen from my recent uh, Tale of Four Gamers video, I got my first game of Age of Sigmar in recently and I really enjoyed it. So um, I'm going to paint this guy up. I'm going to paint him up in the style of the Red Duke from the days of uh, the old undead, and we'll see how I get on. If I need to wait for him to dry, I've got a white lord and some spooky ghosts to paint as well. So, no, without further ado, let's get down to it. Right, first things first, I've got my painting tray all set up. I've got my Vengorian lord, and I'm gonna just start off by going over a bunch of the skin with a spot of gray seer. Um, this is kind of my own modified vampire skin recipe. Um, but we're not going to talk about vampires first of all. No, no, we are going to talk about the the thing that really you can't avoid talking about the undead without talking about the greatest, perhaps, and the originator of the undead, and that is Nagash. I'm sure everybody who's into this hobby, uh, if they've ever played a game of fantasy, either Age of Sigma or uh, the old world stuff, knows who Nagash is, but he is the great necromancer, the original necromancer, and... Uh, his origin lies pretty much right back near the dawn of the history of the Old World. I mean, if we put aside the, the, the history involving the Elves and the Old Ones and the first kind of war against chaos, then I suppose that's the earliest history. But Nagash is the first human history that we know of. We don't know, obviously, what happened was happening out in Far Cathay, Nippon, or Distant Ind during this period. Uh, Nagash lived in the land of Nekara, uh, the land of the priest kings. So this was essentially their, their analogue of Egypt. And uh, an interesting bit of background that they had for the the Karan civilization was those who were born first, those who were the firstborn sons for Nakara, um, would be sacrificed, in essence, to the gods. But they wouldn't be killed. No, they would be sacrificed insofar as they would be expected to dedicate their lives to the priesthood. So rather than the, perhaps the traditional Western model of first son inherits the throne, second son get bung, gets bunged into the priesthood, in ancient Nakara it was the first son that was sacrificed to uh, the gods, was sent off to serve them in the mortuary cult as a priest, and the second son, Nagash's brother, uh, who would inherit the throne and get to rule all of Khemri. As you might imagine, Nagash did not hold warm feelings about this. Uh, there's a quote from him saying that but for the vagaries of the gods uh, he would have been the greatest ruler that uh, all of uh, Khemri had ever seen, all of Nakara had ever seen, and that he wasn't going to let a mere misfortune of birth stand in his way. Uh, but so this uh, takes the form of him using his time in the mortuary cult to gain vast amounts of knowledge both about their practices and about different magical techniques as well. And really a stroke of luck for Nagash was during his time of study, a group of dark elves was shipwrecked on the coast of Khemri. And uh, from them, uh, he had them imprisoned in one of the great pyramids uh, there, uh, not sort of killed but kept uh, alive as his prisoners. And from there, he was able to learn some of the secrets of dark magic, uh, sort of torturing it out of them, bargaining and promising them their freedom. Although I think everybody knew that it was never going to be on the cards. There was only one way this was going to end. Uh, as you might imagine, he, he used this knowledge uh, to expand his power base and also began experimenting and dabbling with his own magical uh, formulas before eventually, uh, in one night, sort of rising up against uh, his brother, having his brother entombed inside uh, their father's pyramid and claiming the throne for himself. And by this point, his magical gifts were so great that there was no one really who could gainsay him. 
and uh, he and his loyal advisors, including his vizier, uh, an ancient being by the name, who, well, a person who would become an ancient being by the name of Arkan, Arkan the Black. Uh, in the Undead book, there's not really much information about him as a living creature, but if the if you've ever read any of the novels that they wrote around this time, um, it's actually a very interesting character who was a bit of a gambler, was known as Arkan the Black, not because of his black deeds, but because of his black teeth, because he was constantly chewing tobacco and uh, eating sugary sweets. Uh, but yes, uh, Nagash and his followers uh, created a magical formula, which as long as they kept imbibing it would keep them young, incredibly strong, and uh, essentially immortal. And from there, Nagash then turned his studies to expanding on the knowledge that he'd gained uh, in terms of from the Dark Elves in terms of dark magic, but also with the knowledge that he had learned in the mortuary cults. And uh, from there, he'd essentially developed the first lore of necromancy that's why he's known as the great necromancer i suppose is because he is the first necromancer of the warhammer world he wrote the book in fact he wrote nine books the nine books of nagash on necromancy and um he and his followers for centuries ruled over kemri uh, essentially bleeding it dry somewhat appropriately given the model i'm painting uh, of all kind of energy life and future uh, until they had to resort to waging war upon neighboring Prince cities to gain the slaves and supplies they need to continue their expansion. Uh, this eventually led to all the other priest kings of uh, Nakara uniting against Nagash and his followers and waging war against them. And it was during this war that the first advent of the Walking Dead are seen. So that was when Nagash decided that he needed an army that was more powerful than simply the mortals he had at his disposal. And he raised the dead from the ancient tombs and sent them forth against the living. And this was so horrifying to the early Nakaran troops that they'd never you know, seen anything like this before. That it, literally there was examples of whole armies just fleeing in terror when confronted by Nagash's undead legions. Uh, but so the priest kings then had to kind of team up with their mortuary cult followers, uh, advisors, and find a, a way around this. And the way they kind of got around it was drawing on the expertise of the mortuary cult they were able to Im imbue the souls of some of the greatest heroes of nakara into some of the kind of the statuary and essentially create golems living beings of stone and magic uh, with which to combat nagash's dark magic and uh, nagash lost long story short nagash and his followers were defeated and nagash uh, was the last one really kind of left still behind in the, in the tomb while the rest of them were dragged out into the sunlight and, and put to death and rather than uh, share that fate he fled north out of Nakara and wandered really as kind of a, a mindless hermit for a while in the wastelands north of Nakara uh, meanwhile all the priest kings formed a, a solemn pact that they would destroy all of Nagash's knowledge and it would never be allowed to uh, continue. You can imagine how well that went. Uh, the denizens of the city of Lamia, seeking an advantage over their rivals, stole one of the black books of Nagash, and the queen of Lamia, Neferata, uh, used the knowledge containing that to try and recreate Nagash's formula of immortality. Uh, but she wasn't as uh, skilled a sorcerer as Nagash. She didn't have his centuries of knowledge, and the formula she created was a debased version of it that instead whilst granting immortality carried with it a, a curse that meant that the light of the sun would destroy anybody who uh, had imbibed the formula and also that in order to remain alive the formula would require the regular ingestion of human blood yes you guessed it they created vampires Whilst uh, the priest kings eventually had to wage war against the denizens of Lamia, Nagash was not sort of sitting idle. He fled north into the wastelands north of the uh, kingdom of Nakara to eventually finding himself on the shores of an inland sea known as the Sour Sea. That was because it essentially was inimical to all life that grew around it. And the reason for this was it was poisoned by a huge chunk of warpstone. Just wash my brush. That had fallen out of the sky, sort of thousands of years before, and had. There we go. Got the crazy on there. So, what appropriately, because we're talking about warpstone, it had poisoned all of the land around, including the sea. And Nagash is described as living there as a hermit for a, for a few centuries in a cave on the edge of the Sour Sea, uh, before eventually 
making a return and uh, enslaving the essentially the, the ghoul like debased subhuman creatures that lived on the shore of the Sour Sea, forcing them to build a vast citadel for him, which he called Nagash Azir. And it was from this citadel that he then plotted his return and his revenge against uh, Nakara. And it was also to this citadel that the uh, the denizens of Lamia eventually fled when they were undone, when they were uh, discovered by the rest of the priest kings as what they'd been doing, and uh, sort of sought sanctuary with the Dark Lord Nagash. I said the Dark Lord Nagash. You can tell, perhaps... Where the inspiration for Nagash came from, there is very heavily Tolkien-esque overtones of um, Sauron about him. I mean, Sauron himself was even known as the Great Necromancer. I'm just going to crack open some Flesh Terrors Red, and I'm going to paint that over the armour plates on this. But I just want to check something before I do that. Uh, Darren Latham did a painting guide recently um, on the subject of how to paint red armour. And I know I mocked Murray a lot in our recent Tale of Four Gamers video for his repeated layering. But I want to give it a go. It's not... No, it's not Flesh Terror's Red to start. It's Flesh Terror's Red at the end. It's Corn Red to start. So I'm going to throw some Corn Red on the armour plates here, and then I'll carry on telling you about Nagash. Yeah, so the denizens of Lamia fled to uh, Nagash Azir and sought refuge with Nagash, who frankly couldn't be more happy to find a group of uh, essentially immortal, super-powerful uh, generals to lead his army during his revenge against um, the lands of Nikara. Uh, so Nagash mustered a mighty force of undead, gathered from the nearby kind of barrows from the northern tribes, and sort of swarms of the uh, ghoul, debased ghouls that he'd used in the construction of Nagash Azir, um, the bodies of any slaves that he'd taken, living creatures uh, during its construction. Uh, undead carrion beasts from the nearby plains, even zombie dragon bones from the great plain of bones. You get the picture, a massive army, and set forth to um, seek his revenge against Nakara. Um, he reckoned without, though, the king of Nakara at the time. Nakara was united at this point under perhaps its greatest king. I'm not saying that to slight Setra the Mighty. I'm simply saying the truth as I see it. Uh, Al-Kadizar. Al-Kadizar was a, essentially almost like a... A Gilgamesh-style character who was a, a, a demigod amongst the people of Nakara, and he'd been unanimously declared to be the greatest king and united all of the kind of princedoms uh, against Lamia. And it was against him that Nagash brought uh, his horde and uh, again uh, was defeated. And uh, at this point, really, all the vampires were kind of scattered across the, the rest of the world. They fled. Uh, fearing the revenge of the Nakarans. Nagash was forced to retreat back to Nagash Azir, uh, which he then had to subdue because in the meantime the Skaven had uh, tried to take over it because, well, it's a giant citadel built on a huge chunk of warpstone. What else were they going to do? And uh, once again kind of brood and plot his revenge. Being a bit of the petty sort, he decided that if he couldn't rule uh, Nakara, then nobody would. And so he developed a sort of evil enchantment, essentially. A bit of a... Where didn't want it there? Uh, in which he poisoned the mighty river there, the, the, the version of the Nile in the old world, the river of life as it was known. Uh, he poisoned it with a plague spell created from the kind of shards of warpstone from Crippled Peak on which Nagash Hazir sat. And uh, from that, uh, most of Nakara over the next two weeks died. The spell had been tailor-made with the cruelty in which Nagash, I think, is perhaps best known in that everybody would eventually fall foul of this curse, with the exception of al who would be left as the sole vibrant living person in a kingdom of the dead. And uh, in due course, after two weeks had run its course, and almost every living creature in uh, Nakara was now uh, a mouldering skeleton, um, Nagash and his armies just walked into Khemri, found al Khadizar kind of going mad on the throne in the so ancient throne room, took him prisoner, and then returned to Crippled Peak with their prisoner because Nagash had come up with another cunning scheme. So having seen how well he had successfully killed off 
all the living creatures of uh, Nakara. He decided that the, really the best thing he could do would be to kill off every living thing in the world and rule over a land of the dead in which he would have really the only autonomy. He would be the only living, uh, not living, the only thinking autonomous soul. Every other creature in Nakara would be under his thrall. Every other creature in the world would be under his thrall. To this end, he came up with what's known as the Great Ritual. He came up with this plan to... Uh, imbibe vast quantities of warpstone um, from beneath Crippled Peak, uh, with the eventual intention of channeling all that dark magic to raise every dead thing in the world in a single night and set them forth under his will to conquer the world and kill everything else that was alive, which of course then would in turn rise from the dead and join his army. He reckoned without two things. Uh, one, he reckoned without uh, Al-Khadizar, and two, he reckoned without the Skaven and their treachery. He'd kind of reached an accord with the Skaven in that they would stay below decks, as it were. They would stay in the tunnels beneath Nagash's ear, and he would rule above, and they'd split the Warpstone, essentially. And this was just really a, a holding action until such time as Nagash could kill them all off. But uh, they... I think fearing that he would actually succeed in his ritual, with typical Skaven style, decided to betray him, and they broke al out of jail from the dungeons beneath Crippled Peak, armed him with a blade specifically created for the purpose of being able to kill a living god, and sent him forth to seek his revenge on Nagash. This blade was the um, fabled... Now, what was it called? It's not the Cursed Blade, the Doom Blade. Oh, let me check my Warhammer Army's magic. You can take this in an army if you are mad enough, like most Skaven are. Uh, this was the Fellblade, I should have remembered. That is probably the second most expensive magic weapon in the entire game. And um, if you give you an idea of what it did in-game, back in 5th edition, the Fellblade would inflict D6 wounds on every wound inflicted. And a it gave the bearer strength 10, ignored all armor saves. Uh, but if you rolled a sixth wound, you caused those wounds on the bearer instead. So yeah, I mean, pretty inimical to whoever was holding it, but certainly inimical to anything that was struck by it. Um, as Nagash was, he, he successfully completed his ritual. He raised the dead across the entirety of the known world. Dead things crawled from their grave. The living quaked in fear, unsure on what new hell was being unleashed on them. The entirety of the dead forces of Nakara rose up, and I'm not just talking about the ones that had been killed during Nagash's spiteful action, I'm talking about every single dead thing in Nakara, including all of the Tomb Kings who had previously been buried in their pyramids. And just as Nagash was sitting exhausted on his throne, al Khadizar struck. Uh, he lopped off Nagash's hand in the first sweep of the blade, uh, which would go on to become its own magic item by the name of the Cursed Talon, or the Talon of Death. Uh, one of my favourite magic items from back then. It automatically inflicted a wound on a model in base contact every turn. Very handy if you want to kill low-wound, high-toughness models like Chaos Lords. Uh, but uh, in the second blow, he struck Nagash stone dead. Well, properly dead, disintegrating him, and then ran screaming mad from Nagash's ear, carrying Nagash's crown in which he had imbued much of his magical energy. Again, massive Lord of the Rings overtones here with kind of one ring, crown of Nagash, you get it. And uh, then, and still also carrying the fell blade away with him, because certainly none of the Skaven wanted to go anywhere near it. It was like carrying radioactive waste around with you. Um, and then eventually died on the shores of a lake where he would one day be found by a human sorcerer by the name of Cadon, uh, who would go on to found probably the only known citadel of the ghouls, the city of Morcane. Um, there's different elements to the stories of Morcane. In the later editions of the Warhammer Fantasy background, there's a the suggestion that Morcane is potentially also linked to one of the original vampires from uh, Lamia, and that the Get of Ashuran, the, the Strigoi, originate from Morcane. Certainly the original Warhammer Army's undead background, though, Morcane was founded by Cadon uh, with the whisperings of Nagash's crown in his ears and uh, eventually became un sort of fell apart and devolved into monstrosity after Cadon uh, eventually perished. Um, that wasn't the end for Nagash, though. Um, I think it was 
1,666 years. No, it's 1,111 years. I don't hesitate to think whether it's days, months, weeks are involved in there as well. After his demise, Nagash returned from the dead, uh, reconstituting back in his black pyramid down in Kemri. Most put out to discover that the denizens of Kemri had indeed risen from the grave, but would not obey him. In fact, he was hounded out of Kemri by Setra and the other tomb kings who viewed him as a usurper and uh, a great deceiver. And uh, he eventually then set out to try and recover his stole his lost artifacts the the claw the talon uh the um crown uh, and the books of nagash because those items had still carried much of his former power and if he could recover those then he felt that he would be able to uh, return to his original strength uh, the crown by this point had fallen under the um guardianship of a leader of a bunch of northern tribesmen uh, yep you guessed it it was the man god sigmar and one of the great and mighty deeds that he would undergo during his time on earth, on the um on, on in mortal form as it were uh, was the defeat of nagash during their first titanic throwdown it's also the that was the period when we first met uh, one of the great undead champions of the original background the vamp the white lord krell uh, who was a, an ancient chaos lord, warlord who had died and had been so heavily imbued with fell magic that uh, his bones had ret returned as a mighty white uh, undead lord, chaos sort of lord of bones. And I've got a white king on the skeletal steed there next to me. And yeah, Nagash recruited Krell from his prison uh, to help him try and uh, fight Sigmar. It didn't go well for Krell, for uh, either Krell or Nagash. Krell was eventually re-imprisoned back in his barrow. Nagash, meanwhile, took a direct blow from Galmaraz to the head, had to discorporate again, and it was another few millennia before he could return to bother the old world once more. Since then, up until certainly what the events of the end times, Nagash stayed in Nagash Azir after that, essentially plotting having been foiled twice in his ambitions he didn't want to fail a third time and certainly at the end of kind of the warhammer army's undead book that's where we left nagash nagash was still a playable model in that edition of the rules but it was a, a rare thing that he would go out to try and kind of recover one of his lost books of nagash or some other uh, magical gujar that would allow him the edge the next time he decided to try another world takeover ploy um, so that's really that's a very brief potted history of Nagash. I'm sure there's loads that I've missed out. Like I said, there was three entire novels that were written about Nagash, and that's not including the stuff that happened in the end times, and that's not including the stuff that happened in um, the, the 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 Sigma novel, the three Sigma novels written by Gra uh, Graham McNeil, which are very very good and well worth a read if you can lay your hands on them. Uh, there we are. That is all the red and the bone and the, the, the grey done on that. So that's some initial base coating done. Uh, put him to dry for one minute, and I'll be back in just a few secs. Right, I'm just going to move him to one side while he's drying. And I'm going to just throw some hex ray flame on some of these ghosties that I've got out white here. This is the uh, the Briar Queen's Court uh, from Warhammer Underpants. And yeah, I've painted all of my uh, Nighthorn stuff in the Emerald Legion's colours. Uh, because I really like the colour scheme, I like the background for them in White Dwarf when I first saw it. Uh, but yeah, so um, I mentioned Krell briefly there. I think Krell's worthy of mention again because he would crop up again uh, in the retinue of another fairly infamous figure from Warhammer background, uh, that of Heinrich Kemmler, the Leash Master, as he was known. Uh, so Kemmler was uh, a wizard, a uh, mortal wizard, uh, who was outed uh, for his practice of necromancy and essentially hounded out of polite society and fled... Uh, into the wastes of the world, uh, swearing his revenge. Uh, again, perhaps if everyone was just nicer to necromancers, things wouldn't; these problems wouldn't occur. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, they're always going to forget keeping your spirits up. But so, <laughs> I apologise for that. Heinrich Kemmler wandered mad for a while before a voice in his head directed him to a barrow. Uh, where he was told a mighty hero was drawn. Uh, you may have guessed the voice in his head was, of course, that of Nagash. Uh, in this barrow, uh, once more trapped, was the remains of Krell. And uh, Kemmler was encouraged to uh, essentially free Krell 
from this barrow and then use uh, his uh, brawn to back up uh, Kembler's magical might and uh, encouraged to go forth and you know seek out whatever books that he could find uh, to augment his necromantic talent so that they would all pay sorry wrong fist they would all pay um, again i wonder what possibly could have motivated the voice in his head to tell him that he should go out and seek out the magical books of nagash uh, and again this is one of the traits of nagash in the books is uh, that he, he would use people that he would corrupt and use people um, to his own ends that really nothing was was worthwhile except for um, the the strategies that Nagash was hoping to achieve. But so Kemler's most famous in, uh, throwdown, uh, in what I mentioned briefly in my last Paint Law video, uh, was against the both the Bretonians and the Skaven. Once again, those pesky Skaven thwarting Nagash's schemes. Uh, it was at an abbey in the um, depths of Bretonia, uh, known as Le Maison Tal, uh, the the house of the god Tal. Essentially, it was a shrine, an abbey, uh, to the, the god of the hunt, the god of the forest, Tal. And uh, it was here that um, a ancient magical artifact had been imprisoned, and which Heinrich Kemmler sought to recover, um, ostensibly on his own behalf, but really, I think, perhaps on behalf of his unknown master, the master he didn't realise he was following. And it fell to the uh, Duke Tancred of Quinells, uh, to throw down against him. He features in the Bretonian book. He's a special character you could use. Uh, and meanwhile, the Skaven wanted control of the magical Gujors for themselves. And so this massive three-way battle took place between the three forces. And in the end, Bretonia was victorious, uh, ostensibly because the Skaven backstabbed Kemla and Krell. And Krell fled into the Grey Mountains, taking um, Kemla with him. And there they once more plotted their return to take over the Old World. And uh, again, what I think was quite cool about this was they actually featured it as a battle report in one of the White Dwarfs. So they, they had a, a scenario you could fight out, and they fought it. And uh, if I can find it, perhaps I'll do a short at some point, just briefly talking through the battle of La Maison Tal, because it really was a cool little battle report. Yeah, so one of the other necromancers that's worthy of mention, I've mentioned uh, Heinrich Kemmler. I probably ought to talk a little bit about Dieter Helsnicht. So this was the other human necromancer that cropped up as a special character in the original Undead book. And he's worthy of mention, A, because he's got a cool model. It was a variation on the classic necromancer, mounted necromancer model, but it had a big, chunky staff with a skull on it with bat wings on it. And he was riding on a manticore. I never got this model, but I would quite like to get one one day because it, it does look really cool. And he had a funky banner. But more than that, Dieter is uh, worthy of mention because he was a necromancer during the time of the Three Emperors. And the time of the Three Emperors is, as far as we can tell, when Warhammer, the Old World, is going to be set. So it's quite possible that Dieter might play a prominent role in that, or he might feature as a, a special character, maybe get a new model. Uh, or be, If not, if they just re-released the old model, I would still think that was really cool. So Dieter is another one of these necromancers who is said to have been tied to Nagash. Uh, he was a wizard of Middenheim who was drawn inexorably out of his dark curiosity to visit Nagashizar and returned a changed man, his hair greyed, his skin an unhealthy pallor, and shortly thereafter became known as the Doom Lord, the Detta Helsnicht, the Doom Lord of Middenheim. And he actually features as a battle report in the original 4th edition, 5th edition fantasy undead book. Uh, the High Priest of Ulrich, uh, figured out what Dieter was up to, wasn't having any of it, and uh, raised a company of knights, descended upon his dwelling with the intention of putting him to the flame. Dieter therefore fled from the night, mounted atop the back of his manticore, returned then to the forest, to his secret lair in the Forest of Shadows, there to build up uh, his strength and um, wait for his enemies to believe that he had died. Decades passed, rumours spread that he was dead, but he was not. And eventually the Doom Lord returned to try and destroy Middenheim. Um, once it became the, the, the Elector Count of uh, Middenheim became aware of this, he and the Elector Count of Nordland set out to uh, try and destroy uh, Helsnicht. Um, however, whilst their armies were marching through the forests of Shadow, they were uh, caught in a flank attack, and most of them were essentially dragged off and drowned in the nearby river. Uh, in, in a stroke, Dieter wiped out half of the enemies that were facing him and gained reinforcements from their drowned bodies. Uh, one of the few survivors, though, was the Elector Count himself, and uh, he uh, rallied his army and set out to bring Dieter Helsnicht to an end. Uh, so Dieter uh, launched an attack upon the town of 
Birkehoven, again, what a great name, uh, which was uh, essentially a village that lay between him and the, the rest of uh, Middenheim's army. Uh, his intention, I think, was that if he could destroy uh, what was left of the Nordland army quickly, he could then take his overwhelming force and crush the forces of Middenheim. Um, however, uh, he was outplanned. Um, Middenheim and the Nordlanders uh, caught Dieter in a pincer attack, and uh, eventually he was uh, stabbed by the Elector Count's sword. Um, but uh, although his army crumbled to dust, uh, his body was borne away on the back of his manticore, and some believe he may have survived the battle and has threatened to return one day and bring the doom to Middenheim once more. And yeah, the, the, the army book, I'm just going to quick look, the army book at the time had forces that you could use if you wanted to, to refight this battle. Uh, so Dieter Helsnicht came with a bunch of skeleton horsemen, some white lords, and a bunch of skeleton warriors, zombies, ghouls, carrion, chariots, cross uh, catapults, even skeletons with crossbows, wow. Um, a real kind of mixed force, albeit none of the big monsters like sort of zombie dragons and stuff. No wraiths, no spectral troops like I'm, I'm painting here, either. Uh, mounted against him were then, you can take uh, two armies of uh, Empire troops, the Nordland contingent, composed almost entirely of foot troops and some pistoliers and some artillery, uh, versus the Middenland uh, contingent, which is Knights of the White Wolf, uh, a war wagon, a steam tank, great swords, so more of the, kind of the elite troops. And there's even a Kislev contingent you could throw in there. Um, yeah, really cool um, army lists that you can refight the stuff with if you want to try it. Okay, so those are to one side drying. Um, meanwhile, the big chap, the paints I've laid on earlier are now dry, so it's time to do the next coat on him. And also, conveniently, since we're turning on to one of the vampire models, uh, it is an appropriate time to move on to the next part of Undead Lore. And, I mean, to be honest, as much as I've raved about the Doom Lord and, and Nagash and everything else, uh, this is very much more my favourite part of Undead Lore. Uh, this is, of course, the Vampire Counts of Sylvania. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the other bloodlines in particular detail today, because those can be covered in a future video. I'm going to deal with vampires as they appeared in the Undead book back then. Uh, but so, realistically, there was only one lore of vampires that appeared in Warhammer Army's Undead as it was in 4th um, edition and, and in 5th edition before it was replaced by the Vampire Counts book. Uh, and that is the story of the Vampire Counts of Sylvania. Uh, I love the story on this. Uh, so... Not going to get involved in details or dates or anything like that. Although if you want to pitch a time scale on it, it's roughly around the time of the War of the Three Emperors and also around the time of the um, fall of the Comet on Mordheim, if that gives you a, a clue as to the time scales we're talking about. Uh, but So the story picks up with Count Otto von Drach, Elector Count of Sylvania, in his castle, Drachenhof Castle. And uh, he was laid upon his bed, dying, cursing the gods and cursing the world, for he only had a daughter. Uh, lurking nearby, his obsequious brother uh, was wishing him on his way, whilst all geared to inherit the uh, electoral title, because he had no heir and his daughter was unmarried, so couldn't, uh, didn't have a husband who could uh, take on the title. Uh, incidentally, if you wonder what I'm doing here, I'm just throwing some thinned down Thunderhawk blue with a bit of contrast medium over the top of the grey seer. This is how I do my vampires, and I think it's a great way of getting that kind of pallid, supernaturally pale flesh. And it's a, it's a tutorial idea I took off Mengel Miniatures. If you haven't checked out their tutorials, check them out. Okay, but so, Count Otto von Drach lay dying. Uh, Isabella, his daughter, um, stood by her his bedside, uh, essentially planning her own demise the moment that her father had passed on because the last thing she wanted was to marry her uncle after or even allow her uncle to you know get near her because he'd doubtless try and have his way with her uh, in some horrible way uh laid upon his deathbed count otto von drack swore that he would marry his daughter to the very devil himself to one of the demons of chaos rather than see his brother take the throne an auspicious oath to make, because at that exact moment, the door to the chamber burst open, and a dark and handsome stranger came into the chamber. Uh, whilst um, the uh, Otto's brother uh, blustered and demanded to know who'd let this outsider in, um, the outsider approached the dying Count and asked him if he had meant the pledge that he had made. 
Uh, Otto spying away to get his last, you know, revenge upon his brother, uh, one last spiteful act and uh, secure his daughter's future. Uh, swore that he did and would honour the oath that he had made. Um, the stranger asked Isabella what marriage gift she would take for her hand in marriage, at which she smiled cruelly and informed him that all he needed to do to secure her hand in marriage was pitch her uncle out the tower window, which the stranger duly did. And before Otto uh, could breathe his last, while the death scream of her uncle was still echoing across the valley, um, the somewhat panic-stricken priest of Sigmar uh, swore out the marriage vows for the stranger and Isabella, and Otto von Drack went off to hell a happy man. The stranger introduced himself as Vlad von Karstein, and Isabella was... Uh, for many years, deliriously happy with her handsome, brooding, dark, intelligent uh, husband. Um, all was well for, for many years, all be, and, and Sylvania even prospered for a while under the management of uh, Count von Karstein. For the von Drax had never been particularly good at their responsibilities as uh, elector counts. Um, but... People did notice that there was something strange about this stranger. Um, something strange about the stranger, I think that's what we put it. There was something off about the, the new uh, elect account, that he was never seen out during direct sunlight, and that he would hold strange balls uh, in the middle of the night, um, but uh, never was seen to take wine or other sustenance. Um, all might have gone on well for a while, except Isabella came down with a mysterious wasting sickness. And uh, rather than lose her, uh, when all ma uh, sort of magic and prayers to Shalia and so forth had failed, uh, her husband offered her uh, immortality at his side if that was what she truly wanted, and she accepted his dark gift, and he then drew her into vampirism alongside him, and things escalated again from there. Um, it was only after, I suppose, people noticed that, um, yes, okay, the peasants of... Sylvania were not particularly long-lived at the best of times, and the nobility obviously had always had a longer life expectancy than them. But when even the oldest grandfather could swear that when he'd been a young boy, the Count had uh, been on the throne uh, for many years, that people began to ask questions about this. Um, questions perhaps asked a tad too late um, on uh, Hemisnacht. The uh, knight with the strongest currents of dark magic of the year, Vlad revealed his true self and made a play for the imperial throne. You've got to remember this is a point in time when there wasn't a specific emperor in charge. There were three emperors contesting over who was going to be in charge. This went on for about a hundred years or so. So whilst we talk about the time of the three emperors, that was actually about a, a relatively long period of imperial history. But anyway, he declared as an act to count he was equally entitled to make his play for the throne, gathered an army of the dead to do so, and set forth from Sylvania with both living and undead soldiers at his command, determined to subdue the emperor and uh, found his own empire of blood. And one of the things I like about Vlad is that he would essentially offer his... Uh, offer the occupants of any town or village or army that he came up with the opportunity to surrender, giving them a simple choice. Serve him in life or serve him in death. Uh, those who chose uh, would serve him in life. He would honour, you know, he would um, be true to his word and they would live as vassals under his rule. Uh, those who chose uh, the alternative, well, he would butcher them, him and his army, and they would then rise up and still continue to advance his cause and his claim. And... <coughs> Excuse me a minute. He slaughtered his way across much of the empire in this way. Um, eventually coming to the very outskirts of Altdorf. If you want the full story, there's some awesome books uh, that were written on something. There was a trilogy called the Dominion Trilogy, uh, which deals uh, with the story, the full story of the vampire counts of Sylvania. I hardly recommend giving them a read. Maybe I'll do like a book review video of them or something. But um, slaughtered his way across um, the empire, uh, brought um, Midden, the previously believed to be impregnable fortress of Middenheim to its knees using an army of banshees, wraiths and ghosts who weren't stopped by the high walls because they could simply pass straight through them. 
um, eventually came to Artdorf itself, seat of the Imperial throne, and um, again offered them the choice to, to submit and, and hand him the throne, or um, he would take it from them. And, uh, well, he's just going to dry. It was at this point that whilst the somewhat wet behind the ears um, pretended the Imperial throne uh, was cowering on the walls, the uh, the old arch lector of Sigmar rose up and gave Vlad here the answer uh, before anybody else could, could <laughs> discuss whether they really wanted to, to bow down to the vampire. He told the fiend to go do one. And... Um, Vlad therefore laid siege to Artdorf. Vlad came in the rules with a magic item. It's a magic item named after him. It's one that I used a lot back when I was playing Warhammer Armies Undead. That's the Cast Iron Ring. In magic item terms, what this basically meant was any time your vampire was killed, the first time he was killed, he would come back to life with full wounds entirely. Essentially, you had to kill a vampire twice. Killing them once wasn't simply enough. This is reflected very much in the story of Vlad von Karstein, that no matter how many times people believed him to be dead, the next day he would be back alive and stalking the the, the old world once more, and whoever had thought to have brought him to um, damnation would usually find their head on a spike, or else, if they were particularly skilled at martial arms, might even be invited to, to, to join his army, um, forcibly given the blood kiss to become uh, one of his... Um, sort of lesser thralls I'm just going to pause and grab another miniature paint while he's drying I thought I'd throw some paint on this white lord um, but yeah so the arch lecture of Sigmar had figured out what Vlad's secret was and he laid a trap for the most cunning thief in all of Artdorf uh, a man by the name of Felix Mann and as essentially, once he had been captured, he offered him the choice that um, thieves very rarely get either. Normally, the punishment for thieving in Artdorf was to have both hands lopped off. He offered man the choice to either receive the traditional punishment or undertake one uh, very special mission on his behalf and uh, never be seen uh, in the Empire again, uh, sort of exile uh, with his ill-gotten gains. Um, as you may have guessed, the item that man was dispatched to go and steal was the Karstein ring from the sleeping finger of uh, Vlad von Karstein during his time in his coffin during the day. Uh, man succeeded in this task. Uh, Vlad, as you might imagine, was extremely angry about this, sought to vent his wrath upon uh, the people of Artdorf, and in the end died grappling mano a mano with the arch lecturer of Sigmar who dragged him off the walls of the city down into the spike filled ditch uh, where Vlad died with a stake through the heart even as the arch lector was impaled upon the same spike. Um, Isabella the story goes um, killed herself the following day rather than continue for an eternity without her love. Uh, the stories the novels give a slightly different spin on what happened with Isabella. Um, what is known is that man did not get to escape with his ill-gotten gains, but instead was found um, essentially hands and uh, eyes chopped off and taken out uh, and left to beg on the streets of Artdorf uh, of the Karstein Ring. Nothing more was seen at that time. Uh, more on that later. Um, Vlad was replaced by one of his lesser uh, thralls, uh, Count Conrad von Karstein, who by all accounts was completely mad. He was a few bats short of a belfry. Uh, he would, um, it was essentially very much a Caligula figure, he would one minute be a brilliant fighter and tactical genius, the next minute he would be screaming that a wood was looking at him funny and demanding that his soldiers hack it down. Um, these mad fits of rage, uh, while making him a mighty warrior, were not particularly conducive to conquering and uh, ruling. And in due course, he was in turn killed by a dwarven adventurer and uh, some sort of empire uh, witch hunters. That might have been the end of the Wars of the Vampire Counts, except the final of the von Karsteins uh, took over at that point. Uh, whilst uh, Conrad had perhaps been the most mighty fighter of all of the thralls that... Uh, Vlad had get Manfred von Karstein was the most cunning and the most devious and whilst others had uh, been squabbling over the scraps of Vlad's empire in the days after his undue staking Manfred had been using his time to uh, go away and study the arts of necromancy and so he became this almost kind of sorcerer lord 
version of a necro of a vampire lord and in the rules he was very much more of a, a magician a skilled magician uh, compared to some of the others uh, of that you could take uh, vampire counts um but yeah manfred um was not as magnanimous as vlad it was not none of this serve me in life or serve me in death uh, but he was um, certainly far more skilled as a tactical mind than um conrad and he very nearly brought the end of the empire during this period uh, before he was eventually confronted by a combined force of dwarves and humans at an area of the empire known as Helfen, uh, and there he was uh, decapitated and his body thrown into the swamp and uh, that might very well have been the end of Manfred and I certainly think given what his role was in some of the end time stuff that was to come later and essentially being partially responsible for the end of the world and still be causing all manner of hell and damnation in the mortal realms since then um, it might have been for the best if it had if it were not for a little bit of William King fiction that they threw into the classic Warhammer Army's Undead book in which two adventurers by the name of Gotrek Gerdeson and Felix Jaeger were wandering through Sylvania when they spotted lights in a mysterious castle and went to investigate there they found a necromancer engaged in an evil ritual to sacrifice a young maiden from the nearby village uh, over some mouldering old bones with the intention of restoring them to life. Gotrek dealt with this swine in the usual way that Gotrek was wont to do, chopping him to little pieces with his magic axe, uh, whilst Felix comforted the buxom young maiden, uh, as Felix has wanted to do. Um, what they didn't take into account was the fact that it didn't matter whose blood was spilled upon the bones, any blood would uh, suffice to complete the ritual. At which point a darkly handsome man rose in a cloud of smoke from the bones, um, bid them both good day, telling them that he was no way near stupid enough to fight some, a warrior of Gotrek's calibre, uh, especially one who was wielding an axe as magical as Gotrek's, and thank you very much, I'll see you again another time, and off he went. Uh, but that was the uh, essentially the canonical return of Manfred von Karstein from the dead because Godrek and Felix got lost whilst wandering and ended up uh, interfering in a necromantic ritual, which I always really rather like in the background. But yeah, so that's really kind of just a whistle-stop tour of the Warhammer Army's Undead. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed listening to me rabbit on about that a little bit. At some point, I'm going to do a video dealing with the rest of the vampire counts. So I will deal with... Um, the different bloodlines, the Strigoi, the Blood Dragon, Necrarch, and of course the Lamian. And I will also talk at length about one of my all-time favourite vampire characters, the one whom I'm seeking to duplicate in this guy who is drying here, uh, that of the Red Duke. Uh, that model featured fairly heavily in my armies during my early days of playing Undead. That was my usual mounted vampire lord. And yeah, uh, I'll do a whole video on Circle of Blood at some point, which is one of the greatest stories of, uh, of the Undead ever told. Uh, there was a novel written by C.L. Werner. I could get into it now, but I won't. I'm not going to get into it now. What I'll do instead is this. I'll say thanks very much for bearing with me on this video. I hope um, you've enjoyed listening to me waffle on about the undead. Hope you've enjoyed seeing me paint this stuff. When I've got some more of it done, I'll throw some pictures up on Twitter. So make sure you follow me on Twitter and uh, keep up to date with what I'm doing there. And I'll also throw some pictures of the work in progress on the um, community feed for my subscribers. So if you're not a subscriber already, please give a click and go ahead and subscribe. Uh, Thanks very much. I will catch you next time.